There's something very exciting about participating in new work. You feel like you are able to discover with the singers and with the orchestra and with the composer how this thing is going to go. And also you can change things. You can't just ask Puccini if you can change this note. Um, but if something doesn't work, you can ask the composer and, and see, if, uh, see if she'll make a change. That's conductor Robert Wood. He's the founder and general director of the contemporary opera company Urban Arias. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Robert Wood conducts opera across the country. He spent years with San Francisco Opera and with Minnesota Opera. He loves classical opera, but he also longed for work that speaks to our present time in a more informal way. He had the idea to bring short, contemporary operas that are sung in English and present them in smaller, less intimidating venues. He wanted to be part of the process that brought opera into the 21st century and return it to the vital popular art form it once had been. Eight years ago, he did just that when he founded Urban Arias, a company that commissions and stages contemporary opera for a contemporary audience in the Washington, D.C. area. Operating with a small budget and a big imagination, Robert Wood and Urban Aria's board president, singer Susan Derry, procure first-class talent for all aspects of their productions, and the results have been remarkable. Critics and audiences alike have been wowed by the concept and by the music. Susan Derry and Bob Wood stopped by the NEA studios recently to talk about Urban Aria's, and I began our conversation with the basics. Help me with a definition of opera. It's obviously more than a piece of theater that's sung through, because Hamilton, for example, could be an opera. There's only one line of dialogue in the whole thing, but it's not. It's musical theater. So how should we define opera? I think your sung through definition is, is essential, but I would add to that that it is meant to be and can only be performed by people with a certain kind of trained voice. And even though opera may cross over with other things like musical theater, jazz, blues, what have you, it's that classical solid training and the demands, the vocal demands that are in the operatic literature, even in the contemporary literature, that's what separates it from musical theater, which has a different set of demands, like, for example, tap. <laughs> we don't ask that. Of, uh, At least not yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, how would you characterize it? Well, I think it's that soaring moment of that emotional expression through the human voice that's so exciting in opera. And we have it in music theater, too, but it's just to the nth degree. More heightened in opera? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a way to think about it? For sure. I have to laugh. A prominent musical theater composer who also crosses over to opera once asked me to prepare a chorus for him, and he said, you know, it should sound really natural and authentic, you know, like musical theater. I knew what he meant in terms of acting style being often more naturalistic, but musical theater is just as artificial, oh, just yeah. in a different way. People, people don't break into tap dances when they're right. in love? Are you right, kidding? Right. Well, I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you for giving me hope out there. Let's talk about your organization, which is Urban Arias, a name which I think is really kind of brilliant. Thank you. That's um, nice. What is it? What is it that you want to do with Urban Arias? When I founded the company, I had an idea to create something that was not going to duplicate what other people were doing. You know, I, I've worked as a conductor for 20 plus years, and often you approach the standard rep and everyone is always interested in what you're going to cut. So shortened versions of, of operas seemed like that could be a thing, right? The Peter Brooks Carmen was so terribly successful. It's a wonderful adaptation of the piece. He removes the chorus. He shortens it all by you know, at least an hour, right? Which is, for some audiences, is not a bad thing. But the idea of doing just short pieces that were, that were condensed versions of other stuff didn't appeal to me as much as doing chamber works that were meant to be the length that they were. And I settled on about 90 minutes. That's a feature film length, mostly, right? So figuring that if people's barriers to embracing opera and loving it as much as I do are usually length and language, what if we did everything in English and what if nothing we did was more than 90 minutes long? And then the contemporary part of it came from 
what can I do for this art form that will help it continue to propagate, continue to be a meaningful part of the 21st century dialogue around the arts? And I had worked for a long time at the San Francisco Opera, Santa Fe Opera, and a lot of places that did a lot of big commissions, underlining big. And some of those were really awfully successful, like Dead Man Walking or A Streetcar Named Desire. Some of them were less so. And one of the things that I thought was, why couldn't this person have started something smaller with the company that was going to help that person learn how to write in her own style or simply give that person an outlet for a really wonderful, brilliant, shorter piece of work that would then inspire audiences to come and see smaller stuff and that would also help this person continue to find her voice. So I guess what I'm trying to say is with a smaller company and with less financial pressure, the stakes are are more realistic and they're really about whether or not the audience is, is entertained and if they've been moved and if their perspective has been broadened. So because of the size, it enables you to be much more flexible straight across the board. We're very nimble. That's the word I was looking yes, for. Yes, it's a good word. We'd like to be bigger, and uh, the NEA has actually helped us achieve that. We've grown, I would say, reasonably and carefully since our inception. We've now been around for seven years, eight years, yes. eight seasons, which I think is a testament to slow and steady. Now, Susan, what attracted you to take on the happy task of being president of the board? Well, that's a fun story. So Maestro and I went to college together, and we found ourselves in D.C. at the same time. And he said, are you interested in doing this? And I said, for you, sure. <laughs> and here we are. Here we are. And I love it, and it's great. And I think what's so important about the company as well in terms of like what we're doing and what our mission is. We love the two of us. We love Madame Butterfly. We love Traviata. That's the stuff we were doing together in college. But it is so important to bring the stories of now to the stage as well. And it's so exciting to see yourself on a stage being depicted by someone who has a kick-ass voice and with a beautiful score and telling your story, essentially, something that you can truly relate to, not just beautiful Cho Cho San and La Boheme. Long may they live. <laughs> yeah, of course, it is an either or. And I just have to ask, with opera companies really facing a graying of the audience and really hanging on by their fingernails, it is bold to decide you're beginning an opera company. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the date <laughs> at which I had this idea was 2009, which might tell you something about uh, the overall economic yes. um, situation. So from my perspective, there was no place to go but up. <laughs> uh, and uh, I thought, you know, we're, we're investing in the, at the bottom of the market, so that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it was definitely a question of why not. Not why, but why, <laughs> why not? not? Yeah, Just do it. and why not? Mm -hmm. Because what you're trying to do is something as you say, very new, that hasn't been done. Where do you get the material to perform? Do you commission composers? We do now. We are, in fact, embarking on our, I think it's our fourth commission, oh, wow. um, from uh, Peter Hilliard and Matt Barese, a really, really talented duo who, and in fact, we have uh, the NEA to thank for our very first commission. Thank you. <laughs> which happened uh, because of the NEA. They helped provide the funds for that, and it was the same duo they have a good sense of humor, and they're not afraid to do comedy and opera, and that's so rare, so oh, rare to have so anyone rare. even attempt it. It's really it. difficult. And they write in a voice that's so accessible and colloquial and fun and funny and engaging, and they're really just, they're terrific. They fuse things. The first commission we did from them was called Blue Viola, and it was based on the real story of a guy who left his priceless viola on the sidewalk. He was the principal violist at the CSO. It wound up in the hands of a junk dealer who it was then stolen from him by his sometime girlfriend. She tried to pawn it off with the help of her boss. And uh, it's, a, it's a farce, but sort of a dark one. They get caught, needless to say. <laughs> um, but Peter wrote just this extraordinary part for, a, for the viola as, as part of this, and an ensemble of six, of which the viola was the principal thing, and, and four singers. You wonder why you never had a good day. World full of wonders you think are junk. Smart man, find them, turn them around. Stand back, yo, black Indiana Jones, hustling <laughs> Louis treasure from the plinth of Maxwell Street. 
Our latest one from them is, uh, the working title is The Thirteenther, and this is a dark comedy for our times on the blue state, red state divide. So yeah, we do commission. We find stuff also from uh, one really wonderful source for new work, which is American Opera Projects. They're based in New York. They do a lot of our work for us. They find composer librettist teams and they match them up and they commission stuff from them. And then Susan has also pointed me in the direction. We do, we like crossover stuff. We try for accessibility. Yeah, accessibility is really key when it comes down to it. If we get, if it gets too crunchy, then, you know, our listeners are not, they can't get past that to get to these amazing stories. Obviously, the music is important, but yes. so, so is the story. Right. And, yes. and it needs to be Bottom at line. least a co-equal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. If you think of opera as sung stories, then they are absolutely equal. And you want the music to be really specific to being able to tell that story. And you want to feel like another score would not have done that work. But at the same time, if the difficulty of hearing the music for the first time provides such a barrier... That can be tremendously off-putting to somebody embracing this for the first time. I will say, we don't dumb things down. No, we, not we, at all. I mean, we've done really challenging stuff. But we're more open, say, to an opera that is a, a fusion. Like, Blue Viola was actually quite bluesy, and it was meant to be a fusion piece between blues and opera. Other companies are now becoming more open to that. Memphis Opera, or sorry, Opera Memphis just did it. I think this idea of taking smaller-scale pieces and doing them in smaller venues... But that and, and doing contemporary work that are telling contemporary stories is starting to catch on. It's great to see them move to other companies because that way we know that we're adding to the canon for future generations. That's really exciting. Tell me about the audience who's coming to see your work. We have a strong core of folks who really enjoy what we're doing. And every uh, every season we're gaining in young opera goers, people who are interested in theater who might not necessarily know about this art form, who say, oh, that sounds like a really great story, and I'm going to go see that. And they may not necessarily have said, I think I'm going to go see an opera, but there they are. So it's it's growing, slowly but surely. Yeah, I think we um, formed the company in Arlington, Virginia, and in the D.C. area there is some uh, reluctance to to exit your particular jurisdiction (laughs) and go someplace else, um, largely because of traffic. Cross a river? Yeah, oh exactly. Gosh. I mean, you wouldn't. What's a I moved here from San Francisco. I thought crossing the Bay Bridge was a <laughs> was a big deal, but that's nothing compared to crossing the Potomac. So yeah, and then we've since moved to the Atlas Performing Arts Center. We split our time between there and Signature Theater in Arlington, and so that's been really exciting because um, just purely demographically about who's living in those neighborhoods. We get a lot more people of color that have joined our audience since we've gone to Atlas, and we are fortunate that they follow us where we go other places, too, and vice versa. We're getting suburban people to come into H Street Northeast. When I think of traditional opera, I think of things that are heavily produced, and and rightfully so. It's supposed to be very theatrical. How does urban arias come down on this? Think of it as downtown theater. So we perform in black boxes. The scale of the production can be obviously less than what you would see on a Broadway stage or on a major opera house stage, but that doesn't mean that the elements aren't significant and compelling. And I, Susan still is an actress, and so she does a lot of theater, musical theater, and I think, and you've done a lot of stuff in various kinds of venues. How does that, how would you react to that question? Well, I think it's on a smaller scale, but we really invest heavily in our designers, and I mean, by investing, I mean like we really look for folks who are at the top of their game and are incredibly creative. So we've had sets that are as simple as a park bench or in blue viola, a wall of cardboard boxes, which was fantastic, to really thrilling work with projections, which translates well in a black box space. So while it's on a smaller scale, it's just like theater is developing, we're going that direction as well. What else can you do with the space? Do you need a big piece of scenery or can you evoke the space in a different way and thereby give the actors, the singers, something else to play with, something to spark their creativity as well. And by being in a black box, you get an entirely different experience as an audience member than you do in a, in a large opera house. So you are close enough to the stage that you can see all of the facial expressions, which means we have to hire Susan corrected actors to singers, but I wouldn't do that. I mean, we have to have <laughs> people that are really very skilled with both. Everything is unamplified. And this is what I love with our first-time opera goers. 
they are so impressed with how much sound these people put out and in such a small space you feel it too yeah, in and your own right body there and it's reverberating in you so yes you're right actors bob you conduct every opera presented by urban arias and you work with a music ensemble yes we work with inscape chamber orchestra an excellent chamber orchestra that's based in maryland uh, we've been working with them now for four seasons and they have a core orchestra, I think, of probably 25 people or something like that. And we take whatever portion of that the composition demands. Our upcoming uh, production is called Florida by Randall Eng and Donna Di Novelli. This is a big one for us. It's an orchestra of 17. That's a big deal for us financially, but also it's a big deal in terms of the space. I was just going to ask you, is this at the Atlas? Yeah, mm-hmm. we're, we're going to find out how that blends. <laughs> <laughs> you going to put them? <laughs> well, what we do very successfully is put them kind of in a, in a long rectangle at the back of whatever our, our stage space is. And this means that I typically have my back to the stage where I'm standing in a corner of the, of the orchestra so that I have some direct contact with the stage. It's like conducting a concert. It works very well. With this kind of stuff, we have to prepare so thoroughly and we have to rehearse it so well because it's all new and new music is, is difficult. It's not like you can go get six recordings and choose your interpretation of it, or much less that you've been studying the aria since you started college. So everyone is working really hard to just get it in, and as a result, the preparation period means that it's not a bad thing for me to be standing behind the singers. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about how much you have to rehearse because you are dealing with new pieces and singers who might not be used to singing contemporary work. Well, well, we don't hire the latter kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're pretty specific about that. Yeah. You know, resume and reputation and word of mouth are really important for hiring people. I still freelance conduct around. Susan works around a lot. And so we both have a, a large network of people that can recommend people that are going to be the right people for each role. It's very specific. Tell me about the rehearsal process, like with with Florida. Sure. So we typically rehearse, uh, as we go for this, two or three days with just music, and that helps. I mean, in opera, unlike spoken theater, people are expected to arrive with everything learned and memorized, and in theater, you don't do that. So because of that particular working peccadillo, you can stage opera in about two weeks. And of course, because we have short works that don't have chorus in them, uh, you don't have to spend three weeks and then, you know, have umpteen chorus calls and, you know, do it separately with the chorus and the principles and then put it all together. The scale of what we're doing helps make that process faster. And then we uh, have a week of tech in the theater. And that is always, um, it seems like less than we need, but we always pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I think is so exciting about the the young people, the actors out there that we're able to hire is that they come in with this incredible musical ability that's so intense, but more and more we're getting folks who are so compelling as performers. And that is really exciting to see for the, the future of sung theater. And are the composers typically in the theater when you're rehearsing? Uh, <laughs> as little as possible. <laughs> no, uh, they will. We have an open door policy on that, and we've had a variety of responses to it. We've had some people that really wanted to be on board the whole time, and other people that you know trust us and will come in for the first rehearsal with the orchestra, or a couple of technical rehearsals in the theater, or the last rehearsal in the rehearsal room, something like that. There's something very exciting about participating in new work. You feel like you are able to discover with the singers and with the orchestra and with the composer how this thing is going to go. And also you can change things. You can't just ask Puccini if you can change this note. Um, but if something doesn't work, you can ask the composer and, and see, if, uh, see if she'll make a change. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, actually. Um, if you're finding everybody's up there and it's just not flying. Yeah. Well, and that's really important, and I think we tend to try to work with, just as we engage singers that are very good actors and that are easy to work with, we also try to engage composers that are easy to work with because that kind of flexibility is really important. I mean, if the, if the and I've been there in situations that, in my life where the elephant in the room is that the scene doesn't work, but and there are 20 people that think that, but the composer isn't one of them. And, uh, <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. yeah. And then you're stuck. Mm-hmm. And I think that also, being a smaller company and a more nimble company, the, the, our whole atmosphere and our ethos is just more casual. So while we care a lot about the standards of what we put on the stage, the working atmosphere is very collegial. Mm-hmm. And I think that those conversations are probably easier. 
How do you as the conductor work with the director? Susan, you still perform and you sing. Mm -hmm. You sing musical theater and you sing opera. Uh, Mostly just musical theater now, but I'm also teaching around town. So that's actually really fun to see young people coming up, coming to see the opera and saying, hey, maybe I want to do that. And do you find young people are interested in opera? Yes. Yes, they are out there. And when they think that they're not interested, when they see what we're doing, they go, huh, that's really kind of cool to be able to use your instrument in that way to tell a story. I need to know about opera improv, please. <laughs> <laughs> it is so fun. So when I was in graduate school in New York, we had this fantastic teacher uh, come in to do our singing acting class. And her name was Rhoda Levine. Hi, Rhoda, if you're out there. Um, and she had us do improvisation in this class. And let me tell you, we were all terrified. She would give us a situation, and she would give the pianist, the accompanist, a mood and also sort of a time period, and they would just start to play, and you had your other person, and you were required to start singing your improvisation. And after a while, this became the the class that we all looked forward to, and it was so much fun, and you got to, you were using your voice, but you were also doing all this silly stuff, and so we decided to recreate it here, and it, it it goes over big, and I think the singers really enjoy it. Are they terrified? Not yeah. The, yeah. Well, you have to get used to it, and there's a certain amount of just letting go, which I think they find very useful in performing generally. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is so important to be able to do that when you're in an audition situation, even if you're doing something planned, to figure out how can you respond to a director? How can you respond to someone that you are being asked to re- uh, read with or sing with? So it's really, really useful, even though like they all look like they're going to throw up when we <laughs> ask them to do it. Well, it's And not everyone, this is not everyone's strength. No. So we audition very carefully for people that clearly can demonstrate an aptitude for this. And in fact, we have improv auditions periodically to, to fill out this part of our roster, right? And now we've figured out We have an actual series of these, so now we're able to do these with more regularity than we have been for the last several years. And so I've now found a a bunch of people that can can really do this well. And I think it's so smart because it's two two art forms that you just never think of combining. Well, right. It's that... Uh, dissonance is really exciting for people because it's, you know, they they think it's a a real gas. And then the other thing is um, finding, you know, the the buzz is all about, well, what do we do to make people find, uh, to make people embrace live theater and the arts and what have you? And, you know, they're being asked to sit quietly in seats and no one wants to do that anymore. Improv is interactive because Mm -hmm. we take suggestions from the audience about what they're going to see. So we create skits and scenarios. One of our favorites is to ask somebody in the audience to tell the story of their first date or their worst date. And then we recreate that as a three or four person opera. Um, And it's fantastic because the person who gave you the story has a hand in essentially composing, creating this new work of art. It's really fun. Yeah. You said that you're looking to diversify your audience. And what about in terms of the artists who are on your stage? Because you're a D.C. company and D.C. is still a majority black city, a huge Hispanic population. So in terms of the artists on the stage and the artists composing. Yeah, I mean, we, we're we always mindful of that. And I think, as a colleague of mine once said, this was a big discussion, a big subject of discussion at an Opera America conference a couple of years ago. Um, and this colleague got very frustrated because everyone was speaking about it in a certain way. And, and her view was, this is a networking issue. With it. You know, you just, if you don't know enough people of color or with, you know, the right kind of diversity that you're looking for, then you just need to meet them, you know, and just ask around. And uh, for example, we just did an opera based on the life of Frank Lloyd Wright, and we cast Wright as an African American. Uh, I wasn't something that I deliberately thought of that I needed to do until the person that was the best for the role was was black. (laughs) So I thought, well, all right, that's what we're going to do. Fantastic. Opera was once popular entertainment, but now it's seen as elite, and in no small way. It's because of ticket prices. Opera, I understand, is very expensive to produce, but ticket prices really can put it out of reach for most people. How do you price your tickets? Where are we right now? We're at... 
Uh, 43 to 45, which is really cheap for who we're offering as artists. I mean, I like, for example, Michael Mays has sung with us a bunch of times, and he just did uh, Dead Man Walking at the Kennedy Center with Washington National Opera. He's done that role a lot. I mean, I, I challenge you to find a seat in the Kennedy Center where you can see his face for $45. <laughs> and we deliberately keep them low. Yeah, it's really vital, really vital to getting the community to come in the door. An opera can also, I don't know, make people feel like an outsider. It can be intimidating because people think there's this code of behavior that's associated with it. And we knocked on those barriers, too. I mean, we're in a black box. You're already not going to feel as formal as if as you would in a jewel box theater. Yeah, we encourage uh, our patrons to go to the bar and come in with their beverage of choice. Which you can't do in some older places because, you know, the the maintenance for cleaning all that up would be, uh, it would be tough. Yeah. So I, I think we do have that advantage. And then and getting and, you know, other more formal organizations are embracing that, at least in part of their season as well. They try to do things in smaller venues where they do have that flexibility because I think, you know, we're all aware that the, the zeitgeist is pointing us towards like, again, movies. So you want something that's feature length and you also want to be able to bring your popcorn in. So, And what about things like talk back and, and that kind of audience engagement? We do one for every show, every performance, and it is always fun and interesting. And uh, it, could, it could go on if if I didn't like wave it by right. from the back of the house and say, Dunzo, we could yeah. go on for yeah. hours. We have a very engaged audience, and the I would say easily a third to half of them stay after every performance. And we always have um, the entire cast and then whoever is present from the creative team, if the director is still there, if the authors are there at that performance, they they join in as well. They're lightly moderated by me. I just throw a few softballs and then I get the audience to ask questions. And I have to say the, <laughs> the Washington audience is so well educated oh, that these gosh. are always really interesting. And they, the participants, the performers will always say to me after, it's, wow, God, you have a really smart audience. And how many productions do you do a year now? We do three a year now, two at Atlas and one at Signature. And, uh, and that's, that's a lot, but it's um, very good. We noticed that being out of the public eye for such long periods of time, opera by its nature doesn't have very long runs. So, so doing more and then this cabaret series, now that we've been able to really uh, double down on it and, and make it more systematic so that people know that there's something Urban Aries is doing through most of the year, that really helps keep the visibility up. Mm-hmm. Okay, 10 years from now, where would you like to see Urban Arias? I would like to see us have our own home. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Uh, a, a, a mostly permanent home. Yeah. I mean, that's dreaming a little a little big, but I think in 10 not? years, our own home, a regular commissioning thing where we're commissioning once a year, right now we do it maybe every other year, being able to commission more than that would be huge. And I think, yeah, about the same number of productions that we're doing. And regular commissioning is so important because then we are able to continue to add to the art form, which is our goal. Yeah, and we're investing in particular people when we do that that we think are really great. And we don't want them to be one or two hit wonders. We want them to produce as many operas as Verdi did because they're that good, right? So And get them seen around the country as often. Yeah. And... What's next for Urban Arias? We have our grandest opera coming up yet, which is I called I told you before, Florida. This is based on uh, sort of very loosely based on some actual events, but it's about a, a teenage girl who is falsely accused of matricide. We got NEA funding for this actually, so thank you. Uh, the um, she's falsely accused of matricide. The main characters are her, her mother, and and her boyfriend who lives next door. It's a feminist piece. The main point of this is how women and specifically teenage girls, the minute they try to explore or be open about their sexuality, society just comes after them with a vengeance. And so her boyfriend is the one who murdered her mother, and he did it because he was afraid of losing Florida. That's the girl's name. Her name is Florida Fandango. As the libretto says, a name you can dance to, not a name you can trust. <laughs> but um, That is a great line. Yeah. Fantastic. Donna Di Novelli is a, just a fabulous libretta. She has really such an funny. amazing way with words. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's humorous, but it, it's also a, a serious piece. And there we have to leave it. Bob, Susan, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing your production of Florida. Thank you so thank much you for so much. having thank us. Thank you. That's Susan Derry and conductor Robert Wood of the opera company Urban Arias. Their new opera, Florida, 
opens at the Atlas Theater in Washington, D.C. on April 7th. For more information, go to urbanarias.org. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating on Apple. It will help people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.